The bootloader. This is the part of the machine that gets executed first. When you only have one operating system installed, it simply loads the kernel. If you happen to have multiple operating systems or multiple versions of the Linux kernel installed, it allows you to choose which one you wish to start. You are watching episode two of the Layman's Guide to Linux. And today I will discuss what happens when you start your machine right now on Spatry's Cup of Linux. Okay, let's begin. I will start by saying I am not an expert. I am a common PC user just like you, with just a teeny weeny little bit of experience under my belt. I make my best efforts to share my knowledge based on my life experience. However, there is always room for human error. So with all of that out of the way, the first question we will explore is, what is the first thing you see when you turn on your computer? A power on self test or post commences, and in a quick flash, you see branding from the manufacturer of your computer along with a directive to press a certain key combo in order to obtain access to the boot configuration or to run setup. This first bit of information you are seeing comes from the chipset on your main board, and depending on the age of your machine, you are either using a basic input-output system. This is also known as BIOS, or you are using its successor, Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, also known as UFI which everyone hated when it first came out because you could not easily boot Linux or any OS which is not digitally signed. And some people say there was some evil thing that Microsoft was doing. But I think what they had in mind was security more so than trying to lock people out of uh, running the OS of choice. But regardless of which specification your machine is using, when referring to the initial boot sequence, the term BIOS is still commonly used, and therefore I will adhere to that naming convention. The setup software your computer uses is controlled by a chip called the Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor, or CMOS. And those BIOS settings can often be reset by powering down the machine and changing the CMOS jumper on the motherboard. I got a picture of it up there. Or you could actually remove the CMOS battery and then replace it after a minute or two, and that would wipe it clean, and then you could start with a clean slate. This is especially handy if somebody had maybe had set up a password uh, to protect it and that sort of thing. So, just something to keep in mind. So, you've gone through the setup menus, you've set up everything to your liking, your BIOS has gone through its instructions, and now it is looking to your hard drive to go to the next step. It is looking for your master boot record, or MBR. It is this piece of information which gives the computer instructions to either present the user with a menu or jump ahead to load the operating system depending on how things are configured. When you initially install Linux, the software will ask you where to install the bootloader. Some users perform these actions manually when they define drive partitions in Gparted or similar software and then define which partition needs to have the boot flag. I believe I've demonstrated this uh, in my Arch Linux install recently. Now, on a Linux machine, the master boot record processes its instructions and then sends you to the bootloader screen. And there are many different types of bootloaders available, far too many for me to mention in this series. However, I will provide links to resources in the description below where you may obtain more information if this is of interest to you. Now, the most widely used bootloader on the desktop PC is, drumroll please, the Windows Boot Manager. 
Now, if you ever decided to install Windows after you installed Linux, you know you will not be able to boot Linux again until you use a rescue disk and install an alternative bootloader. Fortunately, these alternatives are not hostile. They will detect your installed operating system and present you with a menu so you can choose which OS you would like to run. The most widely used bootloader I have seen on most Linux distributions uh, is from the GNU project called Grand Unified Bootloader, or GRUB for short. And another option is called Lilo, which is short for Linux Loader. And there is a new standard based on GRUB, which presents an elegant menu called Brand New Unified Loader from GRUB, or BERG for short. And then there's one you guys who distro hops see all the time. And uh, that one is called SysLinux, which is commonly used to boot live media and flash disks. Now, since Scrub is the most widely used and the loader I have the most experience with, I'll take a few moments to share my experience with it. Grub's primary function is to get the Linux kernel or your Windows installation for you multi-booters loaded into your PC's memory and running. The kernel and the associated files are located in the slash boot directory in your root file system. In addition to performing this function, special commands can be passed before loading the kernel so that specialized hardware may be able to operate. And an example of this that happened to me recently, I had installed Manjaro on a friend's Dell notebook and a special command line parameter needed to be passed in order to set up the backlight. And that was the only thing that was preventing that OS from being able to boot. And so running a special command line parameter was the solve for that. But also other commands can be passed as well, such as setting the screen resolution and other things. And as you can see from the screenshots here, Grub2 can have some elegant themes, arguably nicer than the Berg screens that I've seen out there. And there are plenty of themes for Grub2 available online free. And while we are on that topic, you can change the theme by editing your slash Etsy, slash default, slash Grub file, and then running the update Grub command. Now, that may be a little too complicated for some of you out there. So the easier method is to install Grub Customizer and then installing themes from gnomelooks.org's website. Most people will not bother with such customizations anyway. I mean, really, why bother when you only spend five seconds on the boot screen, hey? But the option is available for those who really want it. I mean, some people like me enjoy having a flashy uh, splash screen when the computer starts. And I mean, hey, it's just fun to show people all the really cool things that Linux is capable of that Windows just simply can't do, hey? <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so moving right along. Grub gets its instructions. The kernel is loaded, and the next set of instructions is processed. And at this point, this is where I'm going to stop, because the kernel handles many functions and may require more than one episode to cover all the material I'm planning on discussing. At least uh, that's what I'm thinking, but I could be wrong. Please visit the link in the description for reference materials related to the series. And if you find these videos to be useful to you, please consider supporting us by visiting cupoflinux.com and hitting the donate button. We will see you next time on the Layman's Guide to Linux, where we will discuss the core component of Linux operating systems, the kernel. Peace out. Mm -hmm.